I know what it is to have little. And I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry. And of having plenty and being in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thank you, God. So we have come to the end, or really it's probably more like the beginning, the end of our conversation, at least in worship, looking at this concept of currencies that Eric Law has put together. It was pointed out this morning that it seems odd to think about the currency of money, because money is the currency. But so often in our own lives, money sort of takes on a mythical realm, a power that we give to it, which is sort of strange. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I want to bring you up to speed on this term that he uses, which I've become a fan of, which is called grace anomics. It's this idea that there is enough to go around if we only figure out how. So he developed this institute called the Kaleidoscope Institute, which works with churches and organizations who are looking to be uh, sustainable as well as missional. The idea that we want to be serving others, pouring ourselves out, but also at the same time making sure that in the process of pouring ourselves out that we still have something to sustain because the work that we do is important in this community. He tells the story when people call and ask about what he, his speaking and leadership fees are, he says this, between zero and three thousand dollars, you choose. Based on what you're able to do, and based on what you value, what we're going to do. And in the time that the Kaleidoscope Institute has been around, they have exploded in growth, and in the bottom line, and in staff. What he says is, it's really important to have the value. If he said, if I just went around giving it away for free, no one would value it. Because unfortunately, that's the reality of our world. He said, but at the same time, if we had a set fee, that it would exclude some folks who really would value it kinds of things we're doing. And in all those days, they have never run out of money. It's a fascinating thing. When we got, for those of us who were there uh, at his conference last fall, or last spring, in the Presbytery, at the end, he had a stack of books. He said, I have these books here in front of me. Um, you're welcome to purchase them. The price is, is, I think, $13 or $15. He said, if you're able to pay that, that's great. If you didn't bring any money with you and you want the book, come and get it. Um, he practiced it openly. And he said, if you're able to pay more, you certainly are welcome to do that, too, which might enable this grace economics to work. And through his travels and the process of putting this book together, he stumbled across, and I'm going to talk about him again, John Bon Jovi. You might remember this conversation about a place called Soul Kitchen. It's a fascinating place in New Jersey where he's created this environment that just isn't about the bottom line. It's about creating community out of this garage that has now become a kitchen. And so when you walk in, you either can pay the set amount that they have, which I think is about $10 for a meal, or you can um, pay by volunteering. So the old joke where is I didn't bring my wallet, I have to do dishes, um, it kind of works that way. So you have volunteer folks who are working through the place, and, and oddly enough, it's a sustainable model where folks come, and it's not just that. You end up at tables with people that you don't even know and you begin to form community. You talk to people there, and what he talked about was is that the energy, the excitement, the, the, just the positivity of the people who had come into that space created this, what we called last week, grace margin, this place where people felt comfortable enough to recognize and to share. But it didn't matter that the guy sitting across from you at the table couldn't afford what you could afford, or it didn't matter that the person above the table could have paid for everybody's lunch around the table. They were all there because they were searching for something more, the building of relationships. So on some level, while we talk about the currency of relationship being a currency, over and over again, he talks about relationships being essential. I had a conversation this week with one of the kids. I will not name that child because then I'll owe them money, right, if I point it out that I have, we have a deal. If I name them in the sermons, then I have to pay them 50 cents. And that could get expensive. But I had this conversation about money this week, and the conversation basically went like this. Money isn't anything. It, 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 
cash. It, it, it's just a belief system. It's a temporary medium of exchange. It's a basic economics 101. We know that to be true. Money isn't real. We believe it's real, and it has power over our lives because we believe it. It often can represent things, but we know the way that, that our economy has worked now is that it just works because we believe it works. There was a short story shared that uh, in the late 1800s, uh, in our uh, class this morning, in the late 1800s, banks were just issuing their own currency. And every bank had their own different kind of currency. And it worked for a while, and then it fell apart because people stopped believing. And that was when we had a more national banking system. Because people believed that it was. And we talk about this, just stop for a minute and realize that all the money that you work to get is an illusion. Even the paper that you're holding, it doesn't really represent anything other than what it can actually go and buy for you. So it's a belief system that in some ways can replace other belief systems. We believe in God until we don't have the dollars to do something and then, well, the market wins. The reality is too often in our lives that we can't just ignore money because it is part of the power in our lives, but it often controls the conversations that we have, not just here in the church, but frankly in our own lives, in our homes, in our businesses. We'd like to do that, but we can't. In the next week, I want you to just listen to financial news. If you don't normally do it, right? I want you to spend some time listening and listen to how the conversation goes about money and commodities and markets. My favorite line, and, and obviously I've done this too much and don't really know to dig down any deeper, but my favorite line is when people say, the markets don't like that. <laughs> have, you, have you ever heard that term before? Mm -hmm. right? The markets don't like that, we can't do it. That seems odd to me. To me that sounds like there's a power there, there's a personification there. Now, we don't quite mean it in that way, but in some ways it does become a power and principality in our lives. So part of what stewardship is about when it comes to the currency of the money is helping get a better perspective and putting things a little bit more back in the proper order. In the Reformed tradition, we talk about the greatest sin, the sin that we're most likely to fall into is the sin of idolatry. Makes sense since the first commandment is no idols. And, and what's the first thing that people of Egypt do when they're getting out is they get anxious. They're in the desert, they're in the wilderness, they don't sure that they're going to have enough food. The manna is really not all that tasty after two or three days of honey like crispy bread. And so they're anxious, and what do they do? They take all their gold and they fashion it into a golden bowl. There's a golden bowl outside of Wall Street if you haven't seen it. Which was the symbol of the Egyptian economy. And so here they were. This eternal struggle, we are not alone in this, right? We are not alone in this. It's the idea that somehow the market will save us if we just appease the market enough. And if we're not careful, we can fall into that trap and say, no, we can still work in all of these areas and still recognize and use money, but we have to do it in a different way. So when we talk about it as a power of principality, the first person who comes to mind is the rich young ruler who comes up to Jesus, right? And he says to him, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And he's obviously someone who is very faithful. Right? He says to him, I've done all these things. I, I love the Lord God with all my heart, mind, and soul. I, I, I follow the commandments. And Jesus said, that's great. There's one more thing you have to do. Give away all your money, then come and follow me. Give it to the poor, by the way. Not just give it away, but give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. Now that's it. And it's the only person who's ever been offered an invitation to follow Jesus, where Jesus says, come and follow me, where the person says, uh, turns away and walks away. It's the only time it happens. And it shows that each one of us can fall into this trap of believing that money has the last word. Because it's a currency, it's important to recognize that it's a tool. It's a tool for furthering the kingdom of God, for providing sustainability. What we do here at Westminster, in many ways, I'm going to talk about some of those things in a little bit, has an impact far greater than most of us, I think, realize. And for that reason alone, it matters that we are smart with the resources that we have so that we're enabled to do 
more ministry. That's Calvinist, by the way. Calvin said this really clearly, that we're to save, that we're to save and we're to work, and that's where the Protestant work ethic comes from, and, and in the process we will accumulate so that we can take this and give it to those who don't have it, joyfully. People often miss the joyfully part of Calvin, but he really meant joyfully. Yeah, we give. And he also said, now you get this, he also said that when we give to people in need, we can't beat them up for not having what they don't have. That was Calvin too. How much Calvin can I throw in there without people going to sleep? What giving is about, what stewardship is about, is a spiritual exercise. It's about recognizing and planning and making decisions so that where we spend our money goes to the places we want it to go to. Do you really want to keep paying lots of interest to Bank of America on the credit card? Is that the folks that you want to get that kind of money? Now, I'm not beating anybody up because I have a Bank of America credit card, which I pay interest on and, and this sort of thing. But think about it for a minute. Where you end up putting your resources, is it always in the places that you would like? Sometimes we get ourselves caught for chasing this or chasing that. I saw this picture this week, and I wish I had, I wish I had a screen to show it to you, so I'll do my best to explain it. There's a guy in a suit that has a stick that's hanging. Remember the, the donkey and the stick that had the carrot? Well, at the end of the stick, this person in the suit is a dollar bill. And he's running as fast as he can, right? And then in front of him, he's looking at the dollar, there's, there's a grave that's open. And if we aren't careful, we get into this cycle where we're chasing that, when in reality there's a whole life out there. So this is what stewardship is about, stopping and saying we need to plan to use this currency as best we possibly can. So planning makes sense. Planning ahead. I mean, financial giving, planning your wills. If you don't have them already, please do that, because otherwise somebody else is going to decide where that money's going to go, and you have the opportunity to direct that. So this is why on Monday night, tomorrow night, the session's going to get together and have a long conversation. We put everything in the consent agenda, and then we're going to talk about budget. Not because we're going to hammer out dollars and cents, but we're going to talk about, of all the currencies we've been talking about, where are we putting our resources? And is it in the places where we believe we're called to serve? Imagine doing that at home. So let me say, say this, that the truth is giving is, is a spiritual exercise which enables us to let go a little bit, to hand things over, to learn that what we have is a gift. So in the process of doing that, we also teach the subsequent generation. Maybe as you're thinking about this coming year, I want to think about giving. And you know, everybody says, oh, you know, tithing is the baseline. Well, tithing is an interesting thing. We talk about the 10%. And I think that's a really important idea, but it's also a regressive tax. Like flat tax, if you learn, if I'm getting too far, I, I really didn't take a whole lot of economics courses. Some of you go, yeah, you tell. Um, but the, the one that I got was this idea of having a flat tax means it's regressive. It's regressive because if you make less money, and it takes a larger percentage of your income to pay for it. So this is why I think the church ought to give up 10% and do this instead. And this is going to take you know, a whole different layer of things. If you're able to do 10%, or 15%, or 20%, or more, then you should be doing that. But if 10% is the kind of thing that put you having to split pills, or having to decide whether or not to buy food or medicine, then you should not be given 10%. You see how that works? This goes back to the grace economics piece. If you're able, then do. And if you're not, don't beat yourself up about what you're not able to do. It requires a higher level of maturity. Just setting that baseline is, is very easy. So the discipleship committee has been talking a lot about stewardship, and we, we came up to one conclusion. Every single person in this church could give at least $1 in 2016. That didn't happen in 2015. Now, I'm not putting anybody on the spot, but I think what happens sometimes is we feel like, well, I can't pledge because I just don't 
I know that, that, that children even can somehow in the next year go, you know what, I can pledge to say I will come up with a dollar to give because not only because it matters, but this church matters to me. Whether you're a member or not, or you're part of the community, every single person can do that. And so when you get your pledge card this week, by the way, it's going to come in the mail. There are, there's some floating around. If you want to grab them and take care of them, they're out so you can do them. But they're going to come in the mail. And our hope is that every single person will say, yes, I can commit to just something. Now, the truth is, many of you can give way more than a dollar, right? But some of you are concerned about uncertainties and whether or not to pledge. It helps us know something else. It helps us to know, as a leader, as the session, that people value what we're doing and that they value being here. It's the old adage, is you put some skin in the game. If it's free, it's not a value. It's kind of what Eric Paul talked about. But he also said, if zero is really what you're able to do, then it's really what you're able to do. Write on that pledge card, I absolutely cannot. And that's okay. We honor that because we know you'll be here in other ways, like the kids. All three of them this week will be praying for you. That's one of their gifts to the church. I also know that they've got money in piggy banks that they can give too, right? They, they find money in their way. But next week, when the session comes forward to talk about the budget, it's not just going to be about numbers. And it occurred to me that there's some things going on right now that most of you might not be aware of, that the currency of money that we have in this place has been enabling to happen. So one currency making some other things happening, and I wanted to mention those things first. Some, some of you know, but not all of you know, the kids in the Sunday school class have been uh, learning, obviously, the biblical story. But they also uh, have been memorizing, I know we haven't done memorizing in years and years, but they're memorizing the books of the Bible. Some of them right now could come out, and I wouldn't put them on the spot, we're not going to do that, but could actually tell you from, and, and we just started this in September, they, they could, as part of their lesson, come forward and tell you the books of the Bible in order. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but I'm guessing, and I will say the pastor gets, I get confused around the minor prophets, I'll admit to my family on that. But they're learning these things. They're getting a base so that they can build on it. Because memorization isn't there. But they're also learning the Apostles' Creed. That one's a little harder because they got some language and they're going, I don't know what that means. It's okay. They're going to have you memorize it, they're going to teach you what it means. They're learning the Lord's Prayer. They're learning about what it is to be part of a faith community. They're building community together, and they're learning the stories of our faith. You are enabling them to have a future of understanding. You are creating a legacy through their lives. Not just learning the basics of the faith, but learning the basics of the faith that lead us to serve. Like knowing that they can pray, as well as other things. Our teachers are learning new things all the time because in order to teach, you have to learn. And so we're pouring resources into their education so that they can educate on our behalf and be right now. And in 2016, we're probably going to do three baptisms. These are things that are happening here. But that's internal, right? We also look in front of us. We have a giving congregation. We've got food that's going to the food pantry. We continue to support that. That's part of what goes on in this place. And then we talk about union communion ministries, and most of us have some connection and we various involved in various places. This is stuff that's happening on our behalf, even when we're actually not physically there. The currency of money that we've been provided either in the endowment, as well as our money that we get each week and throughout the year, enable these things to happen. The Ivory Perry Park Concert Series has taken on a life of its own, but I'll run into people who will know about it and say, wow, you all are connected with that? That's an amazing community building thing. And that's people who aren't connected with the fact that we call it one of our community building things. They already know that that's what happens. There are organizations that want to partner with us on that to expand both health care as well as community. All on our behalf. We open up the church building on Monday nights to Veterans for Peace, an organization that's committed to peace, who are veterans themselves. That probably sums up there. They do a lot of peace and, and justice advocacy work. We open up our space to them. <coughs> We've had
held fast food worker movement meetings here, and we continue to offer support either through uh, our individual leadership and, and through our presence when we're on the streets. In the coming year, we're looking for ways to expand our higher education program, not just for kids, but for all the adults, so that we're engaged on multiple levels, that we have uh, ways of, of doing uh, multiple age uh, Generation, intergenerational is the word I was looking for, intergenerational programs in worship and outside so that we have a way of being sustained as we're part and doing justice work. This is what currencies are all about. There's a whole lot more, we'll talk more specifically, but if I keep talking, those of you who haven't gone off yet are going to go that way too. I, I can see that, right. Um, but this is what it's about. Why is it important to give? It's important to give of our whole selves because we believe these things that are happening matter. Or that we have a vision for what could grow as a result or do differently. So when we talk about money, yes, we have to talk about it really clearly and recognize that it is a power in our world, but it's also a currency that is under the control of the one we call it. And so the way we engage that currency, this power in our world, is a, is a spiritual discipline. From the time we make decisions of where we're gonna spend our money, to where we're gonna spend our time, to where we're gonna spend our energy, so that we can continue to develop, to grow in sustainability, and even more importantly, in missional opportunities that are, that are afforded to us because we've been called to this place. So as you prepare, as we prepare to think about the coming year, Take some time to pray. To think about how you will be part either in new ways or in continued ways for the part of the ministry of this church because everyone matters. Everyone matters. Everyone matters. It has a vital role to play. And if you think, I can't do X, Y, and Z, just remember the kids said we can pray. There's something that we all do. Amen.